Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining. Um, good afternoon to those of you here in Europe and uh, good morning to anybody joining us from the US. My name is Andrew Moriarty. I am the senior pricing analyst here at Mintech, um, primarily focusing in the kind of cocoa, coffee and pepper markets. And I'm very pleased that you've been able to join us today for our quick little webinar where we're going to try and bring you some insight from Europe and the US on what's been going on in the cocoa market and what might be happening next. Now, I'm very pleased to be joined today by Jeffrey Rosinski uh, from McKinney Flavel. Um, he is, you know, as I'm sure many of you might be aware of him, he is a very much, you know, a titan in the cocoa industry. And he's joining us, you know, as the commodity and risk management consultant for Coco, and not only Coco, but he covers a variety of, of other commodities. Now, I'm, I'm very pleased to have him with us, and um, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, looking forward to hearing from you, from you, and uh, I'll be adding in my own insight as we go a little bit further into the webinar. Well, thank you, Andrew, and I really appreciate the very kind introduction, and it's a pleasure being with you uh, with you here this morning. So, um, as you all know, we're, we're now into the month of October, and I'll describe October as being one of the biggest months of the year for confectionery. Um, specifically this month, we're going to get a lot of different news pertaining to the chocolate and the cocoa market. Uh, we're going to see the third quarter grind numbers that will be uh, released, and we'll talk about what our forecast is for that, as well as the, uh, the year-end uh, crop year ending estimate for uh, cocoa and, and grind or demand. Uh, we're also in the start of the main crop. So we've, uh, as of October 1st, we're now in the 2020-21 crop year season. Uh, later this month, at the end of the uh, at the end of the month, we're going to get our presidential election, which occurs about once every ten years in the Ivory Coast. So everyone's um, eagerly anticipating that. And then lastly, we have uh, what what is arguably the biggest holiday for confectionery or candy uh, of the year, Halloween, coming up at the end of this month. But this year may look dramatically different uh, due to COVID and social distancing. So it's a it's a lot going on in the uh, in the current month of October for sure. Um, our agenda for today's webcast are the things we're going to try to attempt to cover uh, in as, as, a, as short a, a period as possible with doing it justice. We'll lead off with talking about crops or production from some of the major origins. Uh, we'll transition then talking about the other side of the equation, grinds or demand, and sort of a, a state of the health of the industry uh, on consumption. Uh, we'll dis discuss technical funds and spec activity. Uh, we'll, we'll delve a little bit into product prices and ratio conversations both here in Europe as well as with Andrew's help talking about um, how he's seeing things over in Europe. And then we'll end with a little bit of a geopolitical conversation talking about the upcoming presidential election, which is going to be on the 31st later, later this month. So that will serve as the, uh, the agenda for, for today. So jumping right in and talking about production and um, what I have here is a, is a uh, kind of a who's who of the major producers of cocoa around the world. The big producers are in the line graphs. You can clearly see Ivory Coast and Ghana tend to dominate uh, the other smaller producers. And Ecuador has obviously been, been growing by leaps and bounds as well. And the bar charts down below, and they're unfortunately, um, because they're on the same axis, and we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit uh, a little bit deeper, are the kind of the secondary uh, producers or the smaller, smaller producers uh, around the globe. But you can see that we've gone through about three years where we've had near record production out of West Africa, Ivory Coast specifically. Uh, Ghana has been plagued by a number of different issues. Uh, Swole and shoot has been probably the, uh, you know, the biggest impact uh, for, for that, that country. Um, but we had a little dip in production for the 2019-20 season. And the uh, anticipation now where the forecast is to see a little bit of a recovery going into 2020-21. And when I talk about crop years, I'll be talking about them in, the, in those discrete buckets. So that will be starting in October of last year through the end of September. This year was the 1920 crop year. And we literally are just one week into the 2020-21 crop year, just for everyone's you know, purposes in terms of how we're talking about the statistics. So when you rescale it and you start to take a look at some of those secondary origins, a very interesting observation um, comes to light. So if you were to back up about 15 years ago, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia combined, so that Southeast Asian region used, used to produce about 600,000 metric tons of cocoa collectively. And in the Central South American region, specifically Ecuador and Peru, was producing about 150,000 metric tons. So when you combine the two, you're talking in the neighborhood of 700 to 750,000 metric tons coming out of those, those two regions. Fast forward to where we are today, and you can see what the trend has been over the last decade and a half. Um, Central South America, Ecuador, and Peru, Peru have been coming into their own and are now the, you know, the dominant 
um, region when you stack them up and compare them against Southeast Asia. And Indonesia, Mal Indonesia and Malaysia have been um, slowly decreasing or on a sort of a, a slow um, decay in terms of their annual production. Malaysia has shifted out of cocoa and started favoring other crops um, such as palm uh, and palm kernel oil. Um, and Indonesia, I think, has been kind of following suit to a uh, to a less lesser degree. But this this all becomes a very interesting uh, point when you think about um, bean origination and fobbing cost. The Southeast Asian region, which has been one of the most fast, you know, quickly growing grind regions around the world, uh, is now a net importer of beans. They probably have three times the capacity to grind and process beans than the beans are actually growing. So they unfortunately have kind of followed suit to other origins like Brazil, which is now a net importer to be able to run the capacity uh, within within their country. So just sort of an interesting um, um, highlight here in terms of the when you think about who's processing cocoa around the world and where are they processing it and how much it costs to get the beans from point A to, to point B, where Indonesia, Malaysia, if they're not importing a fair portion or two thirds of their beans to run their capacity, have much higher bean origination costs and that all impacts their bottom lines or their or their margins. So again, our, our total world uh, production forecast, obviously we were down um, uh, a small amount, mostly owing because of smaller mid crops in the 2019, 2020 crop year. Uh, we'll see that more specifically in our in our next upcoming slides where we show the actual bean arrivals or tallies across Ivory Coast and Ghana. And the expectation now anyway, is to see a little bit of recovery in 2020, 21. Um, I think the hope is hope is there that with a higher you know, living income differential, which we will talk about, there'll be more imp imp inputs in the forms of fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides to take better care, husbandry of their crop, and to improve yields around the uh, around the world. So let's talk a little bit more about West Africa. Um, Ivory Coast and Ghana combined uh, constitutes about 65% of total global output. It is why, you know, when you when you start talking about cocoa, most people immediately talk about one of those two key origins because they are two thirds of total global output. And a year ago, we actually started with fairly um, decent arrival numbers. So 2019-20 is the uh, the blue line with the uh, with the circles overlaid on it. And you can see um, through the through the main crop October through March period, we were on pace with the year prior, which you know 2018-19 um, had been the biggest crop ever or bumper crop in Ivory Coast, and we were on on pace to set another you know near record crop. And it wasn't until really the end of the main the main crop, which ended in March, and we got into the mid crop time period, which runs from April through September, that then the numbers started to fade. And you can see we start to started to um, cumulatively fall behind further and further as each month passed by, and that was owing to a, a harsher than normal harmaton or dry season that occurred in the Ivory Coast uh, that negatively impacted um, the uh, the mid crops of both Ivory Coast and Ghana. When you add up the, the the impact in terms of cocoa output across Ivory Coast and Ghana. Um, the estimates are somewhere between 150 and 175,000 tons of beans were lost owing to the harsher than normal harmaton that, that was experienced across West, West Africa. And now we can show Ghana and you can see a very similar um, kind of um, um, impact where we started the uh, the year and accelerated very rapidly as we got into the into the main crop uh, with arrivals that were on on pace with the uh, the year prior uh, there was a lot of hope uh, from the, um, the the Ghana authorities that they were going to get their arms around swollen shoot and try to you know remedy that situation and distribute new you know saplings or seedlings to farmers to try to rejuvenate that space and it wasn't until until the um, April through September time period that it became abundantly clear that uh, we would not achieve um, the the results that were seen in the prior year. And in fact, we, we saw the lowest total uh, crop output when you combine the main crop and mid crop uh, for, for Ghana that, that's been seen over the last five years. So that's where cocoa is grown. And then obviously it's exported. Uh, one, one statistic we like to track are beans in US licensed warehouses. Now we're talking about it very much from more of a, a, a US perspective. Um, the, 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 the cumulative beans that are um, seen in warehouses, you can see in 2019-20 are the, the light blue line. Uh, we are in the drawdown period, you know, time, time of the year. Uh, we will flip very soon over the next uh, couple of months into the stock bill time of the year as the main crop is being exported and flowing out of country and hopefully coming to these shores. 
Um, personally, I, I think my, my two big takeaways on this chart is uh, the rate of deceleration has been less. So that, that in, in my mind, is a, is a key vital statistic in terms of the overall health of the industry. So it seems like people are consuming or going through beans more slowly than they have over the last uh, four or five years. I think a lot of that has been in, induced by COVID and, and lower, lower demand or, or um, grind that's been seen here in the States. I would also like to see the bean stocks a little bit higher than where we are right now. Unfortunately, we're going into this election time period for the uh, for the presidency in the Ivory Coast with the second to, to lowest um, stock number we've seen over the last five years. And I'd feel, I think, a little bit more, um, um, I think, feeling better about the market if our stocks were a, a, a little bit a little bit higher and we had more buffer um, heading into what could be a potentially con contentious election and we'll talk about some of the reasons why when we talk about some of the geopolitics taking place over in the uh, in the Ivory Coast. Uh, Jeff, if I could just real quickly on that point, um, you had mentioned a few slides earlier that we've seen production in Southeast Asia, particularly like Indonesia and Malaysia, drop quite substantially. Do you think in any way that might have been impacting the 19 or even just the last several years of these bean stocks in the US, given that at least for deliveries in, against New York, I believe Southeast Asia is like delivers at par against that exchange. Does that has you've seen that impact this in, at all? Or is it just sort of mainly really in the fundamentals? Yeah, no, it's a good point, Andrew. Because the when you look at the uh, the you know the crops coming Sula beans or Indonesian beans, a lot of them tend to tend to to flow over here to the states. Um, they're a, a when you think of the bean variety, that Sula bean tends to be under fermented. It tends to produce a very hard butter. Um, it's highly sought after in the confectionery industry. Um, it's not considered a, a highly desirable flavor grade uh, bean um, the, the way so, sort of a Ghanaian or an Ivory Coast Maine would be considered. And those beans have tended to flow more into the Western European or that London market. So with with it, to your point, with Indonesia falling off and becoming, you know, a third of the production of what it was even 15 years ago, and most of those beans coming over here to the, here to the States, you can see year, year upon year, we seem to be able to, um, you know, run over here in the States, but we're doing so with, with fewer and fewer bean stocks, you know, progressively over the last couple of years. So that is, that is an important, I think, observation. Great. Thank you. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what's been, what's been talked about in the industry with LID, uh, Living Income Differential. So it's the acronym, and I'm, I've taken people through the evolution or the timeline last year of what was floated uh, by the you know the joint marketing or or the government agencies of of um, both Ivory Co Ivory Co CCC and Ghana Cocoa Bond, kind of working together jointly to set uh, establish prices. Um, and the whole reason for doing that was to try to improve their livelihood or the, or the, uh, uh, the return back to the farmer, which I think everyone would agree is a good thing. The, the tough thing was, how do you implement it? And it all started back in the middle of the, you know, the beginning of the summer last year, where they floated the idea of maintaining a minimum price of $2,600 a metric ton that would go to increasing the farmer revenue or livelihood to the farmer. And they said that they were suspend sales should cocoa prices get, get below that level. And they were targeting to try to sell about 70% of their crop forward um, at those prices. And then about a month later, um, they proposed the idea of a, a bean premium or the living income differential of $400 that would be paid back to the farmer in addition to maintaining the minimum price. Um, then we get into the you know middle of middle to late summer. Um, the cocoa market collapses down below $2,600. I think both of these government agencies realize they have no market mechanism um, to really control either ICE or the um, or the um, um, the London Exchange Life uh, to maintain that minimum price. And so they sort of abandon the $2,600 minimum price, and they really kind of put all their chips on the table in favor of a uh, of a $400 living income differential to increase the livelihood and then maintain a range of prices. Uh, that would be uh, uh, for the farmer between you know, and allow prices to float between that level of twenty two hundred to twenty nine hundred dollars a metric ton, and then we it, we get very into the fall of last year, so literally one year ago, and that's um, when the governments of both Ivory Coast and, and Ghana really kind of threatened to revoke people's sustainability certification pre premiums unless these companies that were contracting and buying beans were willing to actually enter into contracts inclusive of a $400 living income, living income differential because people were an additional, you know, initially somewhat apprehensive about moving forward with the, uh, with the pricing scheme. 
Now, a little bit about the living income differential. So as I've said previously, both Ivory Coast and Ghana collectively are about 3 million metric tons of total global output. So they're about 65% of our, our total world output. So the two countries do maintain somewhat of a pricing car cartel, and they and they both control the um, you know the the grading and the and the issuing of bean export trading certificates to go to you know, licensed exporters. And at this point in the in the uh, in the uh, evolution of things, I would say forward sales probably are about 85% evolved for the 2020-21 crop year. Uh, most people have moved forward with the uh, with the lid, but when it was first floated, it really created a uh, a fall in the traditional bean differential, which is what someone will pay uh, when you combine that bean differential with the with the terminal futures. Uh, it, you can. Um, translated into an, an against actual or an AA into physical delivery of beans meeting a specific grade or quality that's that's needed. And it became very difficult to try to distinguish the traditional bean differential from the lid. And really, it's it's like trying to separate the baby from the bathwater. You really can't do that. Now, you really are quoted a bean differential, which is all inclusive. It, it, it's the traditional bean differential plus the living income differential, the lid premium that someone is paying to, uh, to um, have beans graded and delivered of a specific grade and quality. So it's kind of what we're seeing now around the, uh, around the world. Um, the new farm gate prices have been announced. So we're now we're up around 20, 21%. Uh, which translates into about 1,000 you know, CFA francs for Ivory Coast and about 10,000 CDs for the uh, for, for Ghana. So now we are moving forward with that new living income differential, which is in, uh, hopefully going to improve the livelihood of farmers um, and allow them to afford more inputs into their, taking care of their farms, as I've said previously, whether it's in the form of fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, to try to achieve a, and, and maintain better quality and higher yield for their for their beans. And uh, just real quickly, Jeff, I was going to uh, go back to the point that you made about the origin differentials. I've actually seen that coming through even just in the last couple of days now, where if you look at what, for example, might be like a bean export price out of West Africa, and you look at where the London market is, which West Africa, I think, delivering at par against London as being sort of one of those group one regions, you can see that the, the spread between the two is pretty much $400 right now. So so when you kind of talk about the erosion of, of those sort of traditional origin differentials, I'd be curious to know, like, how have you seen the origin differentials changing, perhaps like outside of West Africa? Yeah, outside of West Africa, if Ivory Coast and Ghana are going to implement a $400 living income differential premium for their beans, it should drive demand for beans from other regions, um, i.e., you know, whether it's Indos, you know, Soloesis out of Ecuador, you know, or, or um, CCN or other bean types out of other mm. regions like Ecuador and Peru. So, um, you know, the, the tide is going to lift all the boats, not necessarily, I think, just the one, you know, just the uh, the Ivory Coast and the, and the mm. Ghana bean differential. So I think we're going to see demand increase for the other bean types as certain processors are looking to try to substitute away in an attempt to try to avoid paying a you know that that premium for those bean types if they have the ability of substituting and using other grades of beans um, it may not work in all applications but that's how in theory it it, sh it should work Sure. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think that that's a really key point you made at the end that, you know, it should work in some applications. I think maybe to some extent with some of the processes I've spoken with here in Europe, they are maybe less inclined to do that because of those sort of specific quality attributes that you were talking about earlier. But I think, you know, in certain parts of the industry, you would be more likely to see that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, right. I've, I've heard the same thing from the industry. Yeah. Great. If, for, if for instance, someone were able to substitute and use a Nigerian bean um, mm. in lieu of taking an Ivorian bean or a Ghanaian bean, if you know quality for quality, they're a close enough match or a substitute that you can you can use that as a as a as a as a substitute, and then pay a lower overall bean differential, it would obviously create a financial incentive to do so. Great, thank you. So that's a little bit about the production side. We're going to flip now. We're into the month of October, as I said, and we're going to be getting third quarter grinds. And we're about a week away from getting the announcements for the third quarter grinds. And let's go through them, you know, major reporting region by major reporting region. Um, the biggest by far is Western Europe. Um, and you can see Q3, I have a, a star um, of it over it. So that's obviously an estimate because that number is not yet out there. Um, you know, my own working estimate for the third quarter would be a Western European grind that's going to be down six percent. Um, so you can see we've uh, registered, you know, you know, at least you know four or f five out of the last six quarters have been either flat or negative numbers. Um, if you 
account for things on a crop year basis. And, and by that, I'm talking about taking Q4 of last year through Q3 of this year, that would give you a full crop year of grind. I like doing it that way because it matches up a crop year of production against a crop year of, of, of grind or demand rather than looking at a crop year of production against an annual year of demand. It, it's really where you take your cutoffs or your bookends for your measurement. As long as you're taking a consecutive 12 month period, I don't think it matters all that much. But if we assume that the third quarter for Western Europe, Europe is down 6%, that would give us a, a crop year ending grind of down 3.8% for the last 12 months or four quarters. Um, the next number will be out on the 13th of, uh, of this month. So coming out in a, a, a little bit more than a uh, in about a week's time. Um, so obviously we, we have had very anemic and, and negative numbers um, as, as COVID has impacted and changed consumption patterns across, across Western Europe. Similar story here in North America. So the next number is going to be released on the 15th. Um, my own working estimate for the third quarter would be down 7.6%, which would bring us for a crop year reporting basis down 6.7% for North America. You can see we've, we've dug ourselves into a fairly deep hole. Um, we've been uh, negative now. That will be five, you know, five quarters or a little bit more than a, than a year, uh, 15 months in a row with negative contraction and grind. At some point, this thing will turn around. And when people are reporting things on a statistical basis, if you're starting with a fairly low denominator, it will become progressively or more and more easy to register big positive numbers working off such a low base. So that's something for everyone to keep in, you know, in the back of your mind when you start thinking about how things are statistically reported. And then finally, Asia, uh, which you know, had been the, the Asian tiger. We've been on, on, uh, on a kind of a, a several, you know, several years of very impressive growth. Um, this area went into contraction mode earlier. COVID obviously impacted China first and spread across Asia first. It was back in February or earlier this year. That's when people realized it was a major problem that was quickly becoming a global pandemic. Um, we've been negative now over the last um, three quarters. And my own expectation is that the third quarter will again be a negative number, um, specifically down 6.8% is the working forecast. That would bring us on a, on a crop year basis. So Q4 of last year you know, through the Q3 of this year to a negative 1.2%. That will be the first negative annual reported uh, result out of Asia that we've had over the last, say, five years. So it, it, is, it is relevant. And the next um, Asian number should be re released on or around the 16th of this month. So that's that's something that I want you to keep in mind. So we just went through the, the three major reporting regions, Western Europe, Americas and Asia's, and you can see that our annual crop year uh, basis is negative, negative, negative. So we've got a lot of red, red tape for the uh, for the market to contend with. The only area that's experienced any kind of growth right now is um, coming out of Western Africa, what's known as GPEX. And we actually had the fourth fourth quarter G, um, the third quarter GPEX numbers that were announced yesterday, uh, literally just announced yesterday. And they were um, announced for the first nine months of this calendar year, so January through September. And we were up 0.8% out of GPEX. If you were to throw in the fourth quarter of 2019 into the mix, I think it probably stands to, uh, to reason that uh, the GPEX grind is in the neighborhood of up around 2 to 2.5%. Two but very, very easily, you can see that's the only area experiencing growth. We've got contraction occurring in three out of the other four major reporting regions. And net net overall grind is, is lower uh, than where we were a year ago. And for me, this is the this is the uh, I think the uh, the significant factor, because if you back up to February earlier this year, the market, most analysts out there were anticipating growth of two and a half percent annual increase in grinds globally. And the only thing that's changed, the numbers the same, two and a half percent, but instead of having a plus in front of it, we're negative. So you've seen a 5% net swing in people's estimates of total global grind. And on a total crop of, let's say, in the neighborhood of 4.5, 4.6 million metric tons, 5% translates to a, you know, a 250,000 metric ton difference in terms of the beans that are, are, you know, are, are going to be needed. Back in February, a lot of people were anticipating a fairly sizable deficit for the current crop year. And basically that deficit has disappeared mostly on the back of you know, the impact of COVID and uh, demand destruction that we've witnessed uh, occurring around the, around the world. So 
looking at things now over the last um, several decades, you can see the uh, the estimate for crop year 2019-20. Uh, we're forecasting it to be down 2.5, 2.6%. Um, one thing becomes um, obvious: it's it's not unprecedented to have two years in a row where you have negative or flat flat demand. So that could happen next year, 2020-21. But as as is more often the case, you actually have a year of contraction followed by a year of recovery or rebound. And you know, my own estimates would be, especially working from a fairly negative base, we went through quarter by quarter and we showed how Western Europe and the Americas in particular have been putting up pretty big negative numbers over the last um, six quarters. At some point, things will turn around and start to grow again. And, and I am anticipating grind recovery as we go into crop year 2021. And I think that's one of the things going to going to decide whether there's going to be a surplus or deficit for the upcoming upcoming crop year for sure. A little bit about weather now. Um, so um, the little dry season, which you know occurs in June, July, and August, it's also affectionately referred to as the silly season. Uh, things were drier than normal across Western Africa. Um, I had noticed uh, an area of cold sea surface temperatures uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, which is just uh, all, you know to, to the south of these of these you know major countries of Ivory Coast and Ghana. Uh, when you get cooler temperatures, you have less evaporation and you have less storm development, and as a result, less precipitation th that occurs. And we did see drier conditions um, that are, that occurred, occurred across the major cocoa, cocoa growing belt of West Africa. Looking at it another way uh, that I think becomes more obvious when you take a look at the 30-year normal rainfall, which is the shaded area uh, in blue, and then we can take a look at, at what, you know, measurable precipitation that's occurred over the last four crop seasons. And the red line is the uh, is the crop year we just went through with the little dry season. You can see that we were below normal in terms of the precipitation that occurred, um, that that hurt the uh, you know the the uh, the you know the mid crop that was being harvested and brought in from the uh, from the trees. This may actually impact um, pod development and um, bean development within those pods on the trees for the upcoming main crop. And given that we've just started, we'll have to watch the, the cumulative arrivals um, as they come into port over the next couple of months to determine whether the, uh, the dry conditions that prevailed in the months of July and September not only impacted the tail end of the mid crop, whether they actually impacted the formation of pods and bean fill out in those pods for the upcoming um, uh, main crop. It's probably too early to tell at this stage. We'll transition now and talk a little bit about the, uh, the speculative community um, or the funds. Um, I think with the prevailing low interest rates that we've seen uh, around the world and economic slowdown and negative GDP forecast, I think a lot of these funds and speculators have been looking for alternative investments. I, didn't, I don't think cocoa is alone in that. I think they've been looking at other commodities, whether it's oil or whether it's gold, uh, as another means of, of a, a commodity classification to invest in to seek better returns with very low interest rates that have uh, that have prevailed. Um, the net managed money category, so the commitments to traders, uh, shows the net spec position. That's the uh, the the, the um, highlighted green area, and then the nearby New York terminal market is the uh, is the blue line. You can see the two mimic one another fairly closely. Um, I, I like kind of looking at it in this fashion. I think it's a little bit clearer where you can see the net man managed money category here in the gray shaded area, and you can see the the impact of, of the futures market underlying here in that uh, in that purple line, kind of overlaid with with the two, and then doing some quick statistical analysis and looking at the weekly reported numbers. I think the thing that becomes immediately obvious is when you've got balanced S and Ds, when there when there's neither a huge um, 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 crop surplus and or deficit. So nothing is fundamentally telling you a direction for the marketplace. It can show the impact of that net managed money category of the speculators. When they're buying in, in, uh, in, uh, in size, they can tend to drive that, that market higher. And likewise, when they're in liquidation mode or when they're doing risk off in their liquidating positions, as occurred back in March when the cocoa market had been trading $2,800 and they started dumping their position and they sent the market right, right down to $21 to $2,200 metric ton when it became, um, I think, apparent with most people that we weren't going to see a big, a big deficit in, in 2019-20 because of demand destruction. Um, and I know, Andrew, you've got you, you manage and, and, and look at the same thing from a London perspective. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I would say your your earlier statement about how, you know, this that 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 sudden sort of fun interest wasn't something that was necessarily unique to Coco. I can absolutely confirm that, you know, ac- across a lot of the ags, you saw the exact same uplift at pretty much the exact same time, you know, especially as we were getting further into lockdown and investors were looking for different places to put their money. But if you look at this chart, you know, it's effectively the same thing that you've just shown in New York. The, the 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 story that's kind of coming out of it is is perhaps slightly skewed from what you see in New York, but it is essentially very similar. If you were to o- overlay, you know, the the net managed money in London across the net managed money in New York, it's not all that different. Sometimes maybe a little bit in phasing. And again, there's also I put this nearby London cocoa price. Uh, one thing I would mention is you can see very very clearly, you know, that correlation between the two. That this is a market that, in particular in London, I think one thing that's important for um all of us to bear in mind is that this London price, as you can see on the right hand side of the chart, is traded in in sterling. It's a pounds per metric ton price. So, you know, for, for, for a lot of speculators, there's also kind of like an FX exposure that comes along with this, um, which makes London perhaps in some cases almost even a little bit more dynamic than New York, it feels like sometimes. But again, that trend is followed the exact same way. What we haven't seen, and this data is up to date just through the, the end of last week in terms of the most recent commitment of traders reports, is we haven't seen that large fall off that's that's happened in New York replicated in London yet. But you can see it's still a similar position where, you know, the you know, managed money had built up their net long position to about 30,000 lots net long. It seems like that's just starting to come off now, uh, particularly in the early part of this week. So I'm expecting that as we get the commitment of traders report, you know, later in the day tomorrow, we will have seen that number start to come down because that sell off has kind of started to increase here in London as well. Yeah, good, good point, Andrew. And we saw the same thing here in the States over the last week or so. Um, specs have been carrying around 45 to maybe 50,000 net long contracts. It depends on whether you track it, just looking at futures or futures and options. But it's over the last week or so that we saw some selling actually finally hit the uh, the terminal market and sent prices right down to the 200, 200 day moving average, which a lot of the uh, the technical funds will, you will use as a signal on, in terms mm-hmm. of whether they want to be long or, or short a particular market. They do also tend to approach cocoa more more often than not from the long side rather than, than the short side. Um, so just another kind of casual ob- observation on the uh, on that spec position. But as you said, the correlation on that, looking at it statistically, when, you know, we generated a correlation coefficient of around 0.8 on an R squared. So um, definitely something that can be significant in the short term. Um, price forecast, and what I've tried to do here is show sort of a, an equilibrium price, if you will, of how we were um, sizing things up back in the early springtime of around $2,300 a metric ton over here in New York, and then defining a, a plus one, not minus one sigma or standard deviation level. And if you're familiar with those statistics, that basically means the price action should try to stay within that range around 68% of the time, and then defining a plus two and minus two standard deviation where price action you would expect to see um, contained within that range around 95% of the time. Um, and for the most part, we did. Uh, we definitely traded um, higher, and I, I would attribute that not only to the entrance of speculators or, or fund money, but also the weakness of the dollar. Um, Andrew mentioned a very important part of the cocoa market, which is currency um, and purchasing price parity, uh, you know, wh- and wh- whether you're denominating something in an appreciating or a depreciating asset. For the most part, the dollar has been depreciating. The Federal Reserve has been definitely been an event of maintaining uh, very low interest rates between a zero and a quarter percent. And at this point, they don't plan on um, going into a hawkish mode or in- increasing interest rates unless we can show continued signs of inflation in excess of t- up two percent. So it seems like we're going to be looking at fairly low interest rates for the foreseeable future. The red dotted line with the arrow I have on that would indicate a sort of a new equilibrium price of where we expect cocoa prices to be trading based on balanced at you know balanced s and d so balanced supply and demand and the dollar where it's valued so we had that right around the 2450 level and lo and behold we we did see some spec liquidation but overall the market seems appears to have bounced off of that 200 day moving average and held that level i think a lot of commercial end users were also extending cover because it had been several months uh, where cocoa prices have been closer to that twenty-six to twenty-seven hundred dollars metric ton, so people were definitely taking this sell-off as an opportunity to extend coverage into twenty twenty-one on this more on this more recent recent market sell-off. Um, powder price history. So uh, we'll I'll talk about things stateside, and then um, I'll let Andrew kind of interject with um, how we're seeing things over in Europe. 
Um, so this would be the uh, price in dollars per uh, per metric ton for just a base working natural um, um, cocoa powder. And you can see that historically we've been fairly stable. Uh, powder here in the states tends to work more as a byproduct credit. Most of the demand or the you know the driver on the ratio tends to be coming from the confectionery side for butter demand specifically and butter ratio. And um, the the byproduct credit is whatever a cocoa processor can then achieve with selling the residual powder that's produced when they're actually pressing liquor uh, to you know principally make the uh, the, the butter and to, to sell the butter. Uh, we've been stable, but you can see prices have been uh, have been rising over the last um, six to nine months. Higher terminal market, and yes, the cake rate underlying cake ratio has been rising as the as the but as the butter ratio has been has been falling here in the states. Sure, and I think you know the 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 that, that's a that's all a good point because that's that's very similar to kind of how I see things shaking out here in Europe as well. Now, I think in Europe, to some degree, the the importance of various types of powder is useful. So when I publish this, for example, how to price history here, which is a Mintech benchmark price, which just to real quickly explain means that I, sitting in my team as a pricing analyst, speak to people in the market. And I, I speak to, you know, a numbers of, you know, traders, you know, brokers, processors, trying to get a sense of where that market is and then publish a price every every week that's based is it's an assessment, like a judgment call based on those conversations I've had. That's what this price has been for for a little while now since it was converted earlier this year. Um, but what you what you've seen in the powder market is is fundamentally the same thing. But this is specifically a, a, a natural sort of. 10, 12 percent fat. Um, whereas here in Europe, obviously, there are there's you know a, a, a little bit more emphasis on things like 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 a Dutch process, you know, alkalized powders, higher fat content powders um, for a variety of sort of niche applications that a lot of times have sort of historical precedence behind them. And but nevertheless, that being said, within this thing, you've seen the exact same trend. In fact, a little bit longer here in Europe, um, not just the last six to nine months, but actually going back, you know, in some cases, almost two years, we've seen powder generally rising up. Now, this doesn't tell the whole story because you'd have to look at the ratio underlying that, which we'll come on to here in a minute. But, you know, suffice it to say, we, we've still seen powder prices relatively elevated here in Europe and actually quite static throughout the year as the lockdowns have created uh, sort of like an additional uplift in demand for powder uh, to some degree at the expense of butter. But again, I think that story actually kind of shakes itself out in the ratios, which we'll come on to in just a minute. Sure. I like to look at things. I think the more telling for me is taking a look at um, the butter ratio um, compared to the underlying cake ratio or the powder ratio. And you think about them combined in, ter uh, in terms of a combined ratio. Um, and one question that came in from um, one of our audience members was, could, could I please explain how the $400 living income, living income differential on the bean is being applied to um, powder, liquor, or butter? It's actually all of the all of the above. So the price you're paying for your futures market when you combine it with your bean premium, which uh, again is going to is going to convert into a physical delivered bean contract of beans from a particular origin of a particular quality, all that affects your bean origination costs. All that impacts the total cost of your of your uh, you know, of supplying your beans, and then based on the yields of the different products, it will be distributed based on the yields into this into those different products. Another question that came in regarded a you know the sustainability premium, um, and, and could I explain how the fair trade minimum price would affect the lid? The two are separate and distinct. So the the living income differential is just the the, the 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 now the bean premium that someone needs to pay to actually get physical delivered beans of a particular grade and quality it does not include any sustainability premium whether you're talking about rainforest alliance boots fair trade all that would be separate and distinct that a buyer would need to pay on top of uh, what they're buying in terms of just conventional conventional beans and then the last question, which kind of leads me into a conversation about the combined ratio, which is, um, could I explain something about you know, the buildup of stocks based on, on the lower grindings we've seen? Um, the stock number that I showed here in the state showed that we have the second lowest over the last five seasons of, of beans and licensed warehouses. So certainly there are stocks available. Um, I wouldn't say it's burdensome. So they, they haven't really weighed on the psyche of the marketplace. We've got the second lowest. So certainly the bean stocks could be higher, especially going into what could be a very contentious election. 
what has weighed on the market is the surplus stocks of butter, of, of specifically um, boxed natural butter in warehouses. And you can see that, I think, more here in the States than has occurred over in Europe, where the downward pressure on the butter ratio since the uh, reaching a, a high of 2000, in, back in 2018, where directionally we've been, we've been moving lower and lower on the, on the butter ratio. Um, by comparison, the cake ratio or the, or the powder ratio hasn't changed all that much. We've been sideways in a range. Um, yeah, lately over the last six to nine months, we've been moving up. But I think that's more uh, owing to the fact that the butter ratio has gotten down to such a low level. Now, when you're a cocoa processor, you really have one of two options. Um, the butter ratio has gotten so low that you really need to raise your cake ratio to achieve a, an acceptable margin for processing those beans, roasting them, grinding them, converting them, them into liquor, pressing them, and then selling the butter and the powder separately. If you go any lower on your cake ratio, given that the direction the butter has gone, you'll be at a negative implied margin, which basically means you would rather choose not to process. You would idle capacity rather than the produce, producing the products. So now you need to sell that powder for more and more because the butter has gotten so cheap here in the in the U.S. So it really comes down to um, you know bare minimum economics. You need to actually be profitable running a pressing operation. Asian processors, who we talked about earlier in this pre presentation, if you have three times the capacity than you do the beans, you need to source those beans from further away. So it also has undermined the margins of people processing a lot of that cheap natural block butter, which has uh, historically or traditionally coming, coming out of Asia. If you now need to import your beans and you're no longer getting that subsidy in Indonesia for doing the value add and processing um, beans grown locally, and you need to source and import those, those beans, you no longer have that. That, that, that competitive advantage from a uh, from a margin standpoint, and I'll I'll turn it over now to uh, to Andrew to talk about how how they see the the the, the matchup between butter versus powder. Sure. Thanks, Jeffrey. And it, it's, it's it's a fundamentally relatively similar story, but with a couple of unique sort of eccentricities here in Europe. I think, you know, the, the point you made about the, uh, the, the the piling up of stocks, well, we saw the exact same thing here in Europe. And I'm aware this is a 10-year chart you're looking at right now, which is, again, the, the two uh, Mintech benchmark prices series. So these are ratios that I assess kind of on a, on a weekly basis. And what we've seen, if you look at the butter ratio, is the butter ratio is starting to sag quite a bit throughout this year. Um, now, this is a six-month forward ratio, I should real quickly mention. So, so Jeffrey's slide before uh, in the US was sort of, you know, more, more of a spot. nearby ratio. Yeah, it's a spot ratio, whereas mine's looking six months forward. And if you kind of look at it the way that, that ratios tend to kind of stack up, you know, almost to some degree, regardless of which way the bean is going in terms of the forward curve on, uh, of the terminal price, the ratios tend to increase the further out you go. Generally, every once in a while, that might flop itself around a bit. But you would expect, and you would right now indeed see higher ratios going six months forward than versus spot here in Europe as well. So if you were looking at spot ratios, you know, rather than it being around 2.5 to 2.55 right now, a spot ratio here in Europe would probably be a little bit closer to 2.45 to 2.5 thereabouts. Now, as I was mentioning, we've seen the butter ratio kind of sagging quite a bit throughout the year. Now, that has, I think, directly impacted the question that we received about those stocks piling up. I was speaking to uh, a couple of traders uh, several months ago, you know, kind of at the, the height of, of lockdown. And the, the general impression was that there, is a, there was a ton of cocoa butter in storage here in Europe. Um, now, it kind of almost makes sense or would stand to reason then that if you're trying to move through that and if you've seen as a result of lockdown, as mentioned, previously uh, an increase in the demand of cocoa powder that you would suddenly start to see those ratios move to incentivize the selling of one versus the other or the and so you we've seen the butter ratios actually start to ease over the last couple of months whereas the powder ratios particularly through a lot of early 2020 and even late 2019 we're getting quite high i mean you can see again looking six months forward an implied ratio you know well above one which you know, in many, many years now, you can see on this chart has not happened here in Europe. Now, that has started to ease back down slightly, but we've actually seen it kind of around where you're hovering around that one mark or, you know, maybe slightly above on the six months forward around 1.02, 1.03 for quite some time now, you know, for, for several weeks. Um, and I think that that kind of helps give you a, an understanding of, you know, well, the butter ratios would be go would be going down because, you know, you're probably less incentivized to, to, to process and produce butter 
right now anyways, because there is quite a lot of it in stock in Europe. Now, that that situation is starting to resolve itself. Um, and then real quickly kind of shifting tack back to um, the point that you made earlier, Jeffrey, about the um, the, the the lid questions that we had come in, um, I thought was, you know, absolutely correct. And I think one of the, the things that maybe sort of important to mention is that like, yeah, ab- the, the, the lid is completely separately distinct from what you would pay for fair trade, for example. Now, the fair trade minimum price, if you're looking at like semi-finished products, so if you're looking at butter, powder, liquor, will be assessed on top of uh, – all of that is assessed on top of the – the conventional price so the non-certified price so the answer is basically it's already there like fair trade will be its own separate thing that takes place off to the side but just as the lid that 400 hundred dollar lid would already be applied to the bean therefore it's already applied to the powder liquor and butter and just worked through those ratios that we were talking about that is you know that exact same methodology would then feed straight into fair trade as well and then all of the fair trade work and the additional cost would happen on the back end of that um so if if i just tick forward real quickly um also the european butter price history i thought was worth mentioning because you know, jeff had spoken to you know some of the dynamics i've seen in the us and you could see the butter price history is kind of a little bit more interesting here in europe because you know, we saw that big dip that happened in on the bean price so on the terminal here in london back sort of in the middle of the year you know we saw that big dip kind of june july it started to come back up now because that ratio from the previous slide hasn't actually changed an awful lot on butter it's come down slightly you actually saw butter prices dip by almost a thousand pounds per ton on this chart you can see whereas on powder that wasn't so much the case on powder because the ratios have been you know consistently firmer because that's been the more in-demand product during lockdown that that same sense hasn't borne out so i think that, that that's a really important discussion to, to have and I'm, I'm glad Jeffrey that you you've kind of brought attention to the fact that that also seems to have been a, a similar but maybe not quite to the same extent happening in the US as well yeah that that's correct Andrew so I would say overall our, our cake ratios or our powder ratios are very similar to what uh, reference prices you were talking about over in Europe I think where we may be a little bit different is the butter ratio which I think is a little bit lower here in the states I'm benchmarking mm. off of a, a base working natural block butter ratio rather than a quality West African li- liquid na- you know liquid natural melted of better quality uh, but be that be sure. that as it may I would say the fact that your you know the, the cake ratio has been flat and maybe increasing slightly but the butter ratio has been going down dramatically really in my mind te- you know tells of an industry that's been dealing with with you know collapsing or or compressing margins so it's been more mm-hmm. and more to difficult, you know, difficult to operate as a cocoa processor. And, and this year going into Halloween, um, I, I don't know what it's going to look like at this point. I think um, Easter was a big disappointment. I think a lot of um, retailers were left with a lot of surplus inventory that didn't sell through. Um, I think that had people very nervous and apprehensive about what Halloween is going to look like this year. Uh, I don't know what it looks like over in Europe, but I know the CDC's official guidance here over the States has been um, advising against door-to-door trick-or-treating or or hosting large events or parties. Um, People are looking to try to um, try to scale, you know, have an event. Yes, celebrate Halloween, but do it in a socially responsible manner in a scaled down fashion. Uh, A a good case in point, I saw a news item this this morning where people are are promoting petite packets where where parents can go go out there and buy a treat for their kids. Maybe not have as have as much candy on hand because you're not going to have as many as many people in groups kind of, you know, going door to door looking for for, you know, passing out candy. And it's unclear whether parents will feel even safe having their you know, children go out in small groups and, and go trick or, tr- trick or treating because of COVID. So we're, we're sort of in uncharted territory as far as that's concerned. Great. Yeah, as, as far as Europe's concerned, I mean, like t- typically Halloween isn't as important of a holiday, at least from a consumer perspective over here. Uh, I think speaking as an American who, you know, grew up over there and then moved to Europe many, many years ago, uh, it, it's it's certainly not nearly to the same extent. But maybe from a producer standpoint, the exact same idea still applies, uh, especially given the fact that so much chocolate production, you know, even for the U.S. market, is still accomplished here in Europe. That, you know, it still has, you know, a, a, a measurable demand um, impact on on, on the producer level, even if it ne- doesn't necessarily on like a European like domestic consumer level, like it's a it's a more muted impact. But I, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think the exact same principle still applies to producers on this side as well. Yeah, so we'll have to just continue to to track and watch things like the Nielsen and the IRI data to mm. see what that sale what the sales are actually looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And then finishing up, uh, just being conscious of time. So uh, the last thing to finish up, we do we do have a presidential election coming up here in the U.S. in the uh, first week of November. But before that, we actually have a very important election occurring in mm. the Ivory Coast. 
and I've kind of highlighted some of the you know the major players and the who's who on the on the left hand side here. We have the current incumbent president on the uh, on the top left, Alassane Wadara, who is uh, in, in currently serving his second term as president of, of the Ivory Coast, uh, and he has decided to move forward and uh, with a constitutional change um, uh, run for a, a third term in office. Uh, and that all came about back in July because his heir apparent, who was his foreign minister, uh, Koulibaly, who had just recently returned from uh, from France for some um, some heart treatment and some some medical uh, treatment over in uh, in France, it was the first week of, of July. He was back in country in the Ivory Coast, and he unexpectedly passed away. And the ruling party was thrown into somewhat of a of a tizzy because the heir apparent was obviously no longer a viable candidate, and that's where his opposition then tried to rally and tried to um, you know mount an, an attempt to, to try to re regain power and the and uh, the presidency of the of the Ivory Coast, and that's where Wadera really changed his mind with running for a third term. It's important to point out that ten years ago, when we had our last presidential election, in which Wadera prevailed against then um, um, uh, President Laurent Bagbo, who's over on the on the right hand side, um, it was what I'll call a failed election. Uh, failed in that although um, Wadera uh, won the election and, and won the vote, Bagbo refused to initially step down from power. Um, so much so, in fact, that he surrounded the hotel of, of Wadera uh, with the military. Uh, and it wasn't until we actually had um, uh, international intervention um, kind of with uh, with UN peacekeepers, um, there were several thousand people that were killed in violence across the country, um, and there was a ban of exports um, that uh, that eventually caused Laurent Bagbo to finally cede uh, the election and Wadera take take power. And leading into this election, it's been very contentious. You've got a, a number of, of candidates who have uh, attempted to you know through the courts of Ivory Coast um, be disqualified. Um, including previous president uh, Lauren Bagbo, as well as his prime opposition, who is uh, uh, Guillaume so uh, Soro, who um, was uh, disqualified from running for the presidency because of embezzlement and, and misappropriation of funds. And so he was taken off the list of viable candidates. Uh, at this point, the, the, the list of candidates who are vying for the presidency are over on the left hand side. I wouldn't think even BDA really stands a strong chance against unseating Wadera in his third term. So more than likely, I think Wadera will be elected for a third, third term in office. But given that the, the previous election 10 years ago resulted in a failed election and a, an attempted military coup and a ban on exports of, of cocoa, certainly something for everyone to be conscious of and keep an eye on. Hopefully that's not the case. We get a smooth transition of power and uh, and, and likely Wadera to, uh, to to serve out a third term in, in, in office. But just wanted to bring up, bring up the fact that we do have a kind of a once in a decade event taking place at the end of this month. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Jeffrey. You know, I, I really appreciate the insight you've been able to share. And, you know, I think it, it, it's kind of complemented quite well what I've been hearing, you know, speaking to the industry here in Europe as well. Um, in that, you know, even though, especially if you look at the terminal markets, you know, these are two different regions, you know, in fundamentally, it seems like, you know, particularly like on the on the physical side of things, you know, the, the industry itself is, is very much global. You know, you have, you know, production coming from one key area and you have consumers everywhere that want that crop. So, you know, fundamentally, it doesn't move all that much. Now, in terms of, uh, the, of the Q and A, you know, I know we've already gone through some questions already that have come in, but you know, uh, but yeah, please feel free to keep sending them through. Um, uh, one question that I had, um, actually, Jeff, for you as well is, you know, we were speaking earlier about some of the uh, the, the slightly drier than normal silly season there in West Africa. And, you know, the impact that that might have, especially as we're looking forward to this this main crop harvest right now, or, or e even potentially, you know, going a little bit further out and looking like at the mid crop, you know, in a few months time. Now, how do you think overall that stacks up against a forecast of, say, Ivory Coast production um, looking ahead to 2021 being relatively similar to what it would have been in 1819? Um, what sort of mitigating effects do you see that might have that, that would that would assuage or, or overcome the fact that we did have quite dry weather a few months uh, over the last couple of months. Yeah, that will obviously come out in the statistics with the port arrivals in uh, mm. in San Pedro and Abidjan as they actually come in in Ivory Coast, as well as the official um, you know cocoa uh, you know, cocoa bod Ghana purchases uh, when they when they get released, whether they actually had a, a, a deleterious or a negative effect on the total size of the of the crop. I think expectations are running high though that with the lid um, and with the bean premiums being higher and more money going into the pocket of the farmer, that there's that financial incentive for farmers to harvest every 
single pod on that on that tree and to take better care of their tree, apply fertilizers at, at the appropriate time. Um, if they have a diseased tree, treat it with fun, fungicide or pesticide and the dis distribution of, of those inputs will be improved with a uh, higher income or higher revenue in the pocket of the farmer. So you've created a huge financial incentive for the cocoa farmers to actually produce more and hopefully that will blunt or um, or or head off any um, negative impact uh, that occurred because of you know slightly lower moisture precipitation that occurred in the little dry season. Um, it's it's difficult. Um, the uh, the cocoa market's very fragmented. You have a lot of you know small shareholders. Um, they're not grown by these large industrial cooperative farms or individual farmers and on individual plots of land. So trying to get your arm around some of that statistical data can be can be challenging. Um, but I think we'll mm. probably know we'll probably know two months into the season whether or not the main crop is shaping up to uh, to be another um, you know banner uh, bumper crop year or or whether we're we're going to you know suffer any ill effects of that of the dryness that occurred. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, speaking to, to traders on this side, uh, the, the, the general sense seems to be, um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but, you know, barring any deleterious effects that we might see, like you said, showing up perhaps in the very early arrivals and ports figures, let's say, you know, over the next couple of weeks, you know, maybe over the next month or so, that the, the general imp opinion seems to be that that boosted impact of that $400 lid should have exactly the impacts that you're seeing. And therefore, most of the sort of private suppliers that I've spoken with will say that, you know, seeing maybe 2021 production in Ivory Coast matching the 1819 production is 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 quite possible. Um, right, right. And, and, and to some degree, perhaps even expected. And I, I know we've only got a few minutes left, but um, I, I had a one other real quick question about Nigeria. So, you know, we, we spoke, you spoke earlier about Ecuador and how we've seen, you know, particularly Ecuador and Peru, although to me, the interesting story is really particularly Ecuador and what's going on there. We've seen that production growing. How about Nigeria? Because for several years now, I think many of us have probably been hearing stories about, you know, Nigeria having this this big push to try and boost their production, you know, to try and plant, you know, more and more hectares of trees every single year um, and to maybe even try and beat some of, you know, their traditional competitors like, you know, Ivory Coast and Ghana at their own game. But, you know, looking at some of the forecasts of, of, for 1920 and even ahead to 2021, we're still seeing Nigeria lag even behind Ecuador's production levels, um, whereas, you know, e Ecuador only 10 years ago was producing far less than Nigeria ever did. Um, how do you see Nigeria trending, just generally speaking? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Nigeria is a significant producer in West Africa, so they'll produce you know in the neighborhood of around three hundred thousand metric tons annually. Um, they were excluded from you know obviously conversations with Ivory Coast and Ghana with their joint marketing activities with the uh, the living income income differential. So it wasn't part of that conversation. It seems like Andrew every year you see an article that they have you know bold ambitions to try to grow uh, co cocoa output and and return mm -hmm. from the cocoa sector and and produce you know five hundred six hundred seven hundred thousand metric tons annually, but they never seem to get there. They always seem to be in that, you know, 285 to 310,000 metric ton camp with the inability to really, you know, uh, grow that crop further. So certainly one to watch, but in that, not necessarily one, I think, with a proven track record that has the ability to, to even get to the, the half a million ton mark. Uh, in, in in my estimation, I think the when you look at global S and Ds, the the most telling thing will be how much um, grind recovery will occur. And one last question that came in is, what's the chance of a, a secondary wave of COVID taking place with you know, imposed government shutdowns that that mandate kind of shuttering of the of the economies, potentially impacting. Sure, that's absolutely a po possibility. Um, but you know, the thing you've got to keep in the back of your mind when you analyze the statistics is working off of a fairly low base. I think it'll be relatively easy to achieve um, the same numbers year on year and actually experience a small bump next year in terms of, of grind recovery. So I think the big mistake that many analysts are going to make as we move into 2021 is underestimation of grind and, and its ability to recover next year. I think that's you know a lot of people who are driving these huge statistics Statistical surpluses for 2021 um, may be a little bit too light on their expectations of, of demand or grind as we get into next year. And maybe that's just me trying to be optimistic, but uh, <laughs> um, it is what it is.
I'd say, you know, having, you know, in, in a previous life being called, you know, sort of someone who's permanently bearish. Um, the, the, the point I was going to make was is actually fundamentally very, I think, similar to what you've said in that to me, almost, you know, fr from a logistical bottleneck perspective. Um, sure. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it's worth saying that, you know, if you're talking about perhaps bean exports or semi-finished product exports from origin, um, that is, uh, I would say, probably less of a concern than maybe what might happen as a result of this presidential election. If you're looking at kind of, you know, major grinding markets, you know, looking at Europe and the US logistical bottlenecks, um, but also absolutely very possible in a in a kind of second wave scenario. But to me, I think, as Jeff, as you were alluding to, I think I think demand is kind of the, the real point there. Um, you know, we've seen those grinding figures go drop as much as they have, particularly in Q2, and quite possibly here in the next week, we'll find out about Q3 as well. Um, but I think the big watch out there is, you know, if demand recovers going into 2021, then, you know, that would see price movement, I think, in quite a different direction. Because if you have logistical bottlenecks, you know, starting to move in, you know, in one direction in terms of pulling, like, price movements, and then you have this reduced so this increased demand sort of pulling it in another direction uh it, it's I, I think it's kind of tough to forecast exactly the, the the impact that might have on price so i think it's probably really worth as you kind of alluded to keeping an eye on what happens just here in the next couple of weeks and months with new crop arrivals with what's happening in the new crop in at origin to see if that's really going to have the impact that it's going to because like you mentioned you know if you were to say like the icco surplus um projections for 1920 as we leave the year are only for about 42,000, I think, is the most recent surplus that they've put out there. Um, we'll probably see that revised in Q4. But needless to say, you know, it's a pretty tightly balanced market and historically has tended to be. So, you know, great question, but uh, difficult to say for sure, but great question. Yep, um, absolutely, Andrew. Great. And I think, you know, now that we've just passed four o'clock here in the UK, I think that probably just about wraps it up in terms of the time that we had for today. But, you know, always feel free to get in touch. Um, we have uh, like contact information right here. Um, you can get in touch at sales at mintechglobal.com. If you wanted to get in touch with me, you can get in touch at pricing at mintechglobal.com. And, you know, it, it also leaves me uh, to say to Jeff, thank you very much um, for your participation and for uh, McKinney Flavel's being able to you know, accommodate this. And uh, we, we really appreciate you being able to join. And um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for listening. And feel free to get in touch if you have any additional questions. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Great. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.